Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. It's uh, Roxanne Durhage of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks for tuning in again this week. Today I have a guest uh, that brings us a lot of expertise in uh, mental well-being. So it's Amanda Webster. Amanda, thanks so much for coming on with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. So Amanda has, has um, quite the path, and I think her story is going to inspire so many people um, that maybe can relate or people that are sitting at home reflecting on when the, when things get tough for them what kind of things uh what should i do right which is oftentimes the questions I, I whether it's a little pothole or a sinkhole i think oftentimes we can all get there periodically in our lives so let me tell you a little bit about amanda's background we're going to just jump right into her story uh, she's a fitness model and a certified wellness coach and she's overcome some issues with depression um, and uh, she says that she was uh, put on uh, antidepressants. That's a bit of a, you were a bit of a guinea pig with that. And uh, it's like a lock and key with that, isn't it? She it really lost is. Her, yeah, she's losing her parents and, and she had some issues with addiction and uh, led to self-harm where she was on a ledge in a hotel, Canadian hotel room um, where she almost took her life. Uh, and after a year and a half of uh, self-discovery, lots of healthy changes um, and being decertified as a serious mental health illness, which I'm interested in hearing about that. Uh, she's become passionate about helping people that are, have struggles with balance and kind of finding fulfillment in their life. So let's just start with who, who you are. Like tell us the story of, of that little girl and, and kind of, you know, what, when did you kind of start to recognize that there was some issues around depression? Well, I think that it started coming about when I was fairly young. I was bullied a lot in schools. I had a great home life. My parents were very loved, very supportive. It's a great home life, but I was that person that never wore the right clothes, didn't have the right friends. So I was very ostracized by my peers, which led to a lot of bullying, which of course led to a lot of um, bad self-worth. I, I didn't really have a very good sense of self-worth because, I mean, none of my peers really wanted to interact with me. And it took me till sixth grade to really have any lasting friendships at all. Unfortunately, I met a couple people then that are still very good friends to me with me to this day. But I think that was kind of the beginning is I, I was very bullied. It started in fifth grade. Well, I think I had one before that that was third or fourth grade. But the real bad bullying started in fifth grade. And from that point on, it just kind of escalated from there that I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I started developing symptoms of depression by my preteens. I had no idea how to handle them. I started seeing therapists. They would pretty much say, well, here's some medication, take the medication and we'll talk for an hour and that's that. And that didn't really do anything for me. I tried medication then and it didn't, it did not react well with me. I would have... I would have a lot of trouble with it. It just didn't feel right. Uh, best case scenario, I just felt, I don't even want to say numb because it wasn't numb because I still felt the feelings inside. I just couldn't express them outwardly. And that was worse. That was worse than crying all the time. That's like, I probably, I, I would really consider it torture. It's really torture to have all of this pain and all these thoughts inside of you that you just can't get out because, you know, you, you've been medicated and, I, I, I tried different medications over the years through my teens and a few more throughout my 20s and early 30s, but it got to the point, there were some that made me hallucinate, there were some that I would just lay on the ground just gasping for air and I couldn't breathe and I thought I was dying. And when I tell this to my mental health professionals, they'd say, oh, well, you just need to give it some time to set into your body. <laughs> Are you serious right now? I will, it, was, it was just insanity. And then I had a mental health professional that told me, 
people like you never make the right decisions. Like pe people with mental health disorders, people with bipolar, I think is what she said I had, will never make the right decisions. So as a teenage 16 year old kid, I have a professional telling me no matter what you do, you're never gonna make the right decisions. Mm. So I, don't, I can't say there was really any starting point. I don't, there wasn't one specific event that you know led me to drinking or led me to drugs or led me to anything, led me to self-harm. It was a series of things. I was sexually assaulted when I was 16, and that obviously just fed more into this bad sense of self-worth because um, I already kind of knew the, the environment that we get ourselves into in the realm of a sexual assault where it's always, well, what were you wearing? What were you doing? What did you say to him? Had you been drinking? I hadn't been drinking. I was wearing a t-shirt. Not that that mattered at all, but I, I, I knew that there was just that's not really going to be any on my side, but that's how I felt at the time that I wasn't going to have anybody on my side. So as time went on and I got old, just felt more and more isolated. Um, I didn't really, I, I moved away when I was 16 from the few friends I did. So I didn't, I was in a whole new environment. That's, I think, when drugs started, when the, the experimenting started, and I went through several years as a teenager just smoking weed all day, every day. I really didn't do anything except just lay around and smoke pot. <laughs> Um, I dropped out of school shortly after the sexual assault because I just, I couldn't face more, I couldn't deal with it. Um, so I dropped out of high school my junior year. And my parents passed in my early teens. I was 20 when my dad died and 20 when my mom died, which just left me spiraling. Like I had no idea to do, where to go, how to function. I don't feel like I had made that shift to being an actual adult. I know that my, people might think that's sad at 22, but when my dad died at 20, my mom was all alone and she needed somebody and she needed support. So I really, I still stayed home and I stayed living with my mom and was trying to support her and help her. So I hadn't moved out. I didn't have any comprehension of the quote unquote real world at this point. So it was a very difficult shift. And I got into a relationship that ended up being very unhealthy and went in and out of that for a few years that led to even more negative um, events in my life. And he moved to Arizona, so I chased him to Arizona because I was in love and that's what we do, <laughs> make dumb decisions when we're in love. Uh, but or we think we're in love. In retrospect, I wasn't. I was afraid to lose him because he's the only thing I knew since my mom died. Uh, he had come directly after her death and that was really the only familiarity I knew. And I didn't want to let it go. And I see that now. But him and I ended up having a son together. I went through very bad uh, postpartum depression, untreated postpartum. I would almost say psychosis. I mean, I was having bad visions and nightmares all the time. And I, I, I didn't sleep very well. Uh, I didn't take good care of myself at all. I, that was when I went to school around that time. I went to college for my mind-body um, certification. And I don't think I really let it sink in. Like I did make some changes based on that and I did see some clients, but I, I don't think I really utilized it to the best of its, um, of what it was offering me. And I just, I, I, I vividly remember the moment that I realized I had to get out of that relationship. So I was just sitting there, I was holding my son. He was still a baby, still slept in a crib, still had diapers. And I remember just sitting there looking down at him and I guess, it was written all over my face because uh, his father walks to the doorway and looks at me and says, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. I just can't do this anymore. And we'd broken up off and on, you know, because that's what you do when you're in a toxic relationship. And we broke it up off and on. But in that moment, I just knew it was done. I was done. I, I knew I couldn't do it anymore. It was, it was very toxic. It was emotionally abusive. I couldn't take it anymore. And I left. And I ended up getting right into another relationship. <laughs> Uh, so I still had to learn my lesson, but it wasn't until 2017 that everything really just fell to rock bottom. Uh, I remember at the time I'd been wrongfully accused of a DUI. I got in a car accident and totaled my new to me car. It wasn't a new car, but it was new to me. I got sued by a client and Chester Bennington from Lincoln Park had taken his life. Now that might seem kind of weird, but Lincoln Park was kind of my lifeline. It was my security blanket for my teen years. So when my mom died or when I was sexually assaulted, that's what I turned to. That's the only healthy advice I ever had. So all of those things happened in two weeks. So in two weeks, I realized that I was facing 
two very big court cases that were going, that could really negatively affect my life. I mean, a DUI, you can lose custody of your kid. I didn't want that on my record because I am extremely against drunk driving. Like I'd probably be more apt to kill somebody than to drive drunk. I'm not saying I would do that, but I wouldn't drive drunk. That's just something I wouldn't do. And I didn't want that being attributed to me. Uh, and then of course the car accident had left some, some physical issues, but yeah, when, when Chester took his life, I just, I didn't know how to handle it because I'm sitting there going, this is the person I look to for strength and motivation. When I got really far down, this is the voice that, that really helped me. So I started using, uh, I, I dabbled in cocaine in the past and I knew that it kind of numbed you out. But that's, and that's what I needed in that moment. I, I just, I couldn't process everything that was going on. I couldn't cope. I didn't know what to do. My relationship was just in turmoil. Everything it seemed was just, crap <laughs> i mean my whole life was falling apart around me and i didn't know what to do so i started using and i will say i didn't use in front of my son but i split custody with his dad so i had plenty of time when he wasn't there um and it became such a frequent thing that it was really all i knew to turn to and it got completely out of control and there was a time when i ended up I was really stressed out, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit of coke, and I looked down, I remember looking down at the little baggie, and it was empty, and I went, oh shit, because I didn't mean to do a lot, but I'd done way more than I intended, just because I was stressed, I was like, okay, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, and before I knew it, I'd done way too much, and you'd think that ending up overdosing on a bathroom floor, and being covered in blood because I ended up um, getting a nosebleed and I was just there was blood all over my t-shirt I was laying on the bathroom floor I couldn't I had no real cognition going on anymore everything was very dissociated and you'd think that would be my breaking point you'd think that would kind of be my wake-up call but I feel like everyone has that different moment where they realize I have to change something and I guess that wasn't mine I don't know why but that was not mine and Things continued uh, to get worse and worse for several months. I ended up getting clean after I met Mike Schnoda, the other singer of Linkin Park. I went and staked out on a sidewalk for an event um, so I could meet him. And that was my breaking point where I knew I had to get clean. I knew that I had to stop self-harming. I was self-harming a lot because when my son was, was with me and I needed advice, that was kind of what I had to go to because I couldn't do the drugs. So... I, I would harm myself and my son never saw it. Like it, I, I was always good about keeping it hidden, keeping it from him. But I realized meeting Mike, it was, it was kind of strange. I would almost call it a spiritual experience because I, I just had this awakening that I was like, I can't do this to myself anymore. This you're sitting here mourning this person that took his life, but um, that's where, that's where this is going. Like, I don't know if you remember the scene in the matrix or if you've ever watched that movie, if your listeners have watched it, where Trinity and Neo are in the car and she's, he's, he's saying he's going to jump out and stuff. And she's saying, you know, that road, you know, exactly where it ends. And I know that's not where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the, the thought I had at that time. I know where this ends because I'm mourning the death of someone who went down this exact path. You know, I know where this is going to end. This is not going to end anywhere good. And that moment I knew I had to get clean. So I did. I stopped using. I didn't go to any kind of support group. I, I did it on my own, which was extremely difficult. I mean, it's hard to do it even with support, but I did it without. And I managed to get clean. I stopped self-harming. I stopped using. I, I utilized different tools on my own uh, to do that. But about six months later, I ended up in that hotel room. And... It's great that I got clean, but the underlying reason why I was using in the first place didn't get addressed. And which was, was what, which, which was what? What was the underlying issue? It was pain. I was in pain and I didn't know how else to cope with it. I didn't know what else to do. And the, I mean, the, like I said, there's a lot of layers as we just talked about. There are a lot of layers from the, the sexual assault, to the bullying to my, my parents' death. You know, there are a lot of layers as to what led me to that point, but I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I, I couldn't handle the pain. And I convinced myself 
in that moment, it's like my brain had turned on me and I convinced myself, this is what's best for everyone. This is what's best for your son. This is what's best for your friends. You won't be a burden on them anymore. And there are a lot of times in my life where I'd been depressed or I'd been, you know, I, I'd struggled with thoughts of suicide or I'd, I'd obviously uh, self-harmed. But in that moment, I didn't have the fear. And normally the only thing that kept me alive was, you know, I had a fear of death, but I remember standing on that ledge and I was looking down and I, the only thing I was really afraid of was, man, I hope this doesn't hurt because I just don't want to hurt anymore. So the only fear I had was the fear of that initial pain. I was just thinking, God, I hope this is fast. And it's really poetic. The thing that brought me down was kind of one of the things, I guess, that had me up there in the first place, which was a Lincoln Park song turned on just outside my hotel room door at that exact moment. Mm. Freaks me out <laughs> because I don't, I don't really believe anything. I'm not an atheist per se, but I don't have any spiritual beliefs. So I have a hard time saying, oh, it was a miracle or whatever, but something definitely wanted me. To so you're, in the, you're in the hotel room, you're on the ledge and in the hotel room, you start to hear a Lincoln Park song. So it was just outside the hotel room door. It turned out to be the cleaning crew, which this was my third or fourth day there. And I hadn't seen anyone. Like when you got to the hotel, you had to call to have someone come to the front desk because they just didn't have... Uh, like a, a service crew of any sort and in the whole the three or four days I've been there and I spent most of my time in the room I hadn't seen a cleaning crew you really never even saw anyone leave their room so it's a very small kind of intimate uh, setting but it freaks me out that in the exact the cleaning crew turned on their music just outside my door I thought I was hallucinating I thought that this was okay this, this, this is what it means for your life to flash before you I'm just hearing this in my head so I, I stepped out and I walked over the door and I kind of popped my head out and looked at the guy and I must have looked like a mess because these two French guys just looked at me like I was insane. And I just, I said in French, oh, that's my favorite song. And the guy said, oh, really? And I went back into my room and just fell apart. I just lost it because now it's like, okay, something's telling me I need to be here. Something's telling me not to jump. I don't know if that's God or an angel or my parents or Chester or whatever, but something was telling me I needed to be here. And I think that was almost more difficult because it's not like I didn't, it's not like I wanted to die. I just didn't want to hurt. I didn't want to feel the pain I was feeling and I didn't know what to do to stop it. Right. So I just, I fell apart in my hotel room and I really had to start analyzing my life like what else can I do to try to bring myself higher and now what I call my happiness spectrum like what can I do to kind of make deposits into that bank because while depression is a very real disease it is a very real physical chemical disorder in your brain there are things you can do to change the neurons in your brain to change your brain so I started kind of doing more research well, I started with the basics of just am I giving my body what it needs to mm -hmm. serve me? And that was kind of where I started. And it was, it was a process like in the weeks after that to really almost come face to face with my demons. I had to face down my own darkness and I had to say, you need to, you need to do something. Like you have to change something. Obviously the medications didn't work. The therapy wasn't particularly successful. The drugs didn't do anything in the long run. Like, what do you do? And I mean, I, I got a lot of great advice during that time and I, I did a lot of research and I, I, I really was just honest with myself because I feel that when you're in that dark place, you're not, you're definitely not honest with yourself because anything you try to tell yourself, your brain is going to give you reasons that that's not true. So if you are saying, well, maybe I should eat more healthier, maybe I should you know, make X, Y, Z decision, your brain's sitting there going, oh, it's not going to do anything. You know, it's not going to do anything. And I think that working with that self-talk is, is definitely a big part of it. It's definitely a big factor in it because you're not your thoughts. You're not your depression. And there are ways to overcome it. It's just, it takes commitment. It takes work. And that's not what we want to hear when we're depressed because we have no energy and we want that quick fix. We do. We very much want that quick fix. But I think that there's certain things you can do that, bring it down to a tolerable level, but bring the, the feelings down to a more manageable level. And that was kind of the beginning of my process. So you went from, I heard the song, right? For whatever reason we can say that happened at that right time. 
at that space. You're at a critical spot. You, you wouldn't have been there had you not heard that song. And it, it popped you back. What we, as a psychotherapist, what it sounds like with depression is that sometimes your thoughts and your actions, a depressed person, you tell me if this may be potentially what kind you experience, that I'm thinking something, this pain, this pain can continue. And, you know, and then I'm disconnected from my body. And then I'm on that ledge. And sometimes, you know, patients have shared with me, then the thought catches up with, you know, it's not that bad, but they've already about to, to do something harmful. It's almost like the thought and the action get so disconnected with depression that sometimes they think, oh, they have another thought that I don't want to die, but they've already started the action. And then the action kind of goes ahead of the thoughts. And then they've maybe done something that, you know, to try to take their life or to attempt. You know, every story I've heard of someone that's attempted suicide, like someone that's jumped off a bridge or someone that's overdosed and survived it, every single one says they regretted it the second they did it. The second they jumped, the second they, you know, took all those pills, they immediately regretted it because nobody really wants to die. That's not the underlying goal here. Nobody says, man, like I, I want to end my life. No, they want to be happy. They don't want to suffer. That's the two mm-hmm. goals of existence. Like every single one of us share those two things. We don't want to suffer and we want to be happy, mm-hmm. but especially in the mental health realm. And I don't know if you've kind of noticed this, but I don't think that there's a lot of expectation for people with mental health. Like the only real expectation is don't kill yourself. Um, they, they, they want to keep you physically safe, but there's no real addressing what's got us in that place. At least this was my experience and I've been to dozens of therapists. My experience was it's, we're going to try and patch this you're never going to get better. Like that was what I was told over and over. This is how it's always going to be. You're always going to be depressed. You're always going to suffer like this. And I mean, who wants to hear that? That's exactly why I ended up on the ledge is because I have professionals, mental health professionals telling me you will always suffer like this. This is your life. This is the disease. I I would say that um, that's unfortunate that that was your experience because I could tell you as being a mental health specialist, that that's not what the core of my colleagues or my practice is about because an addiction or depression generally, if it's not biological, which in your case, it sounds more like it was a situational thing that happened. You started to get bullied. You said you had a pretty good upbringing. um, And then you lost your two parents really, really quickly. Um, It sounds like it was a cumulative effect, right? Right. So as a, as a psychotherapist, what I would say to people is, okay, it's not this, it's not the, you know, um, the addiction, it's what is the root cause? What is so deep within you that the, the addiction is a symptom to what the true pain is? Yeah. You know, and that's, that's how it should be treated. I'm not opposed to um, mental health, the mental health world. Obviously, a lot of people need therapy. Some people need medication. That's, that's obvious. That's the truth. I've never tried to say that there's not a place and time for that. But the fact that nobody would listen to me when I said this medication, no matter what you're giving me, no matter how small the dose, it's not freaking working for me. Nobody would listen to me. And that's very frustrating when you're trying to tell you know, the person that you're supposed to be working with you, how something's affecting you or how you're feeling. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because what we know ideally is that a combination of both is, is best practices, right? Some people need medication. Some people um, kind of, you know, go through the dark spots without medication, but sometimes it's a combination of both. So a lot of times people might go to a physician, they get prescribed something and then they do nothing else. But really what you need to do is to be able to use the medication if you need it short term or maybe longer term to really deal with the core issues that come. So it's a combination effect. Yeah, that's what's been my thing is I think most people barring a really severe mental health disorder, like multiple personality Mm -hmm. or something, most people, medication should be a short term thing. It absolutely should be a short-term thing. And it, I feel like we overuse it in certain situations. For example, when my dad died, I mean, their immediate thing is you need to be on medication. Right, right. My, da- my dad just died and I kind of have the right to mourn my, right. my father's passing and feel those emotions. And for, for me, the, the whole mental health thing is a very tricky, like slippery slope. Because I think if you're doing everything that you can do, if you're really genuinely, truly, honestly doing everything you can do, to help yourself and you're still in that dark spot absolutely 
take the medication if you need to, see a mental health professional to get you out of that darkness if that's what you need. But if you are just wanting a quick fix, that's not what that's for. I don't think that's what medication is meant to be for. It's not meant well, to I, be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it depends on the presenting issue. It depends on the, a lot of the biology. Uh, if there is some biological stuff, absolutely. If it's completely um, those truly psychiatric concerns, then there's no way around it. But what mine, mine was both, actually, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, because yeah. Both, of, both of my parents had mental health. My mom uh, was an alcoholic and my dad had um, some mental health issues okay. presented okay. throughout his life. So mine was both. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you probably had a combination effect, but it doesn't mean because you've had a combination effect that you would. Right. Right. So, but sometimes I often say, and this is the way I look at it, Amanda, is that sometimes you need a bit of a bridge yep. to build up, you know, uh, the pleasure centers in your brain with an antidepressant to be able to start pumping that out again naturally. Because if you're using cocaine, what the, what the brain is saying is, hey, I've got a free flow of this stuff. I'm going to yeah. shut off. I'm going to shut off those centers because the body is already getting it. So naturally, I'm not going to develop it yeah. uh, naturally. And then once you stop, guess what happens? Then you sink into depression, right? Which further exasperates what you're talking about, right? So it's, yeah. you know, it's a, and, then, and then eventually the, the brain will start to do its thing again. But sometimes it's about having... Um, the ability to to give it time and to do some of the things that you're talking about. But I think that there's such a different path for so many people, but you're right. You don't just give someone a pill without saying what really is going on here and getting a full overall assessment yeah. of the entire situation to understand what's going on in the person's life, you know, and then you send them off uh, to get the proper assessment with psychiatry to see if that's the need or if it's, you know, if it's something that they can kind of, you know, do slowly on their own. Yeah, it, it, I, I'm glad to hear that, you know, there's more positivity in that realm. Because like I said, I saw a therapist up until a few years ago from childhood on up. And it was, it was consistently the same thing. You'll always have this depression. Most of them said you'll always have to be on medication. And when I was diagnosed with an SMI in my 20s, they told me you will have this label for life. There is no way to be decertified. That is not possible. I was told that by several different so um, talk a little bit about that because that's you know that in canadian terms that's not a, a term that we would know but by, for anybody that says an smi is a severe mental yeah it's a serious mental illness so right. it essentially means that you will never function like a quote-unquote normal average person um that you'll never really be able to have a the the capacity to do and enjoy things as most people do. So essentially you will always have this, these severe symptoms of depression that interrupt your life, that make it uh, very, very difficult and possible to, to function as a, a standard adult would. Mm, so that's, yeah. that's uh, what I had. That's what, how it was explained to me. Right. Just right. not being able to function at a, at an acceptable rate and you know i will say there was a long time they kept telling me you know you'll never be able to really hold down a job and i had held down several jobs but i don't want an eight to four job and i think that was the big thing there is they're telling me well you can't hold down a job because when i when i went to these eight to four jobs my symptoms of depression would start kicking up even more and i'd have trouble sleeping and i'd, I'd start getting mm. more anxious and stuff but it wasn't the fact that I couldn't, because I have numerous times, it's the fact that I didn't freaking want to. <laughs> I didn't find any pleasure and enjoyment of getting up and going to a job I hated. And I, I had worked for probably about two years at my son's French immersion school, a little under two years. And I just woke up and one, one day, it was kind of like the breakup with my ex and went, I can't freaking do this anymore. Like, I, I just hate this job and I, I don't like working with children. It's just not my passion. Right. Um, and I, I started to build my coaching and build and build those channels more. So at that point, I literally just went to work that day. I'm, I'm one of those people that when I realize I'm done, I'm done. There's no dilly dally. There's no let's think about this. Let's pro and con. You know, in your heart when you're done with something, and I was done. And I went in that day and put in my two weeks. So let's talk about the path that you took, right? So you went, you know, obviously you you had you had a lot of predispositional elements. You said two two parents with mental health. Then you had the bullying. Then you had the sexual assault, which I would think is the biggest factor that would have impacted all those things, uh, you know. Um, and then obviously, then you know, you're one of the symptoms to to numb out the pain is the addiction, and then it becomes a vicious circle. So, okay, so then you start to take some steps. 
what, what kind of things did you learn that worked for you, for anyone listening, that is maybe having something mild or even at the extreme end of the things that you've discussed that has, that helped you? My first thing was really, like I said, getting into what am I doing to my body? What am mm-hmm. I, am I, am I doing everything I can to, as you said, make sure that we're boosting those feel good chemicals in the brain. So if we're drinking alcohol or eating a lot of sugar, eating a lot of processed foods, those things are not going to help us, um, with our, with our neural pathways and with the, the vagus nerve and all that, um, which as you know, is the connection between the, the brain and the gut. And that was kind of my first step was, okay, how should I be treating my body right now? What could I be doing to physically be giving it more of a fighting chance? Right. So I really went through, I don't like to say diet because that's an ugly word to me. It's just, I feel like diet set you up, the word diet just sets you up for failure and it's not a, a permanent thing. I really had to change my lifestyle and I thought I was healthy. I was one of those people that would tell myself, Oh, well, this cupcake's organic and gluten free. <laughs> oh, I can eat it. Right. Like this is gluten free macaroni. So it's good. Uh, bu- buzzwords are just silly, but it, 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 that was kind of my first step was going through that. And then I, I knew that I needed to be active. Cause I mean, I would go to the yoga class or I'd go to the gym every now and then, but I had no real activity. So I wasn't, you know, really building up those endorphins and the serotonin and stuff. And really, I start not just exercise, but I started looking into other things that that help release serotonin, help boost serotonin and, uh, and dopamine and all that in a healthy way, not uh, by checking your Instagram every five minutes for that dopamine hit. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was changing my relationship with food, changing my relationship with my body, because I've always been thin. So I mean, working out wasn't really a priority to me because we we have that mm-hmm. we have that conditioning that you work out when you want to lose weight. You know, that's what you do. It's not we work out to maintain or to help our bodies. We just don't we don't really have that mindset in our society. So having a better relationship with that and just starting to cut out the things that weren't serving me in my life, cutting out the people, cutting out the things, cutting out the habits that weren't serving me in my life. And I mean, there's so many different aspects to it. It wasn't like, okay, well, I just stopped eating sugar. Okay. Well, I just, you know, started running every morning. It wasn't really one specific aspect. There were some herbs that I started taking like Kava Kava, um, that, that really helped, um, Ashtwagonga. I always say that wrong. Ashtwagonga. Ashtwagonga. <laughs> Thank you. I always say that wrong. But um, there were there were some herbs that I started taking to help with the the anxiety with the nervous system, and those were more effective. Just the, the changes combined with that was more effective than two freaking decades of the mental health system. Um, right, so, and I and I always say it's it's finding that path that works for you, right? Unless it's like we said, it's a, a severe mental health disorder. Right. But, you know, and you know, that's the thing. There's there's no there's no specific way to do it other than you know, like you said, you had that epiphany when you're on that balcony, something shifted. It was not your time, right? I'm going to say for whatever reason we can, we can say, yep. and then you start to say, okay, what do I need to do? And it's not a quick fix. It's right? not. And no, it's hard, hard to be know, honest with yourself yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then really, it, you know, being honest means that you have to slow, you have to start to listen and you got to really, I often say, you know, what is it? What are the activities? And this is a loaded question that no longer serves me if I want to replenish and restore. Yep. Which is a huge question. It is. And that's what it boils down to. And that covers so many different things. I remember that when people would tell me, I mean, people would genuinely try and give me advice when I was in this dark spot and tell me, you know, maybe you could, you know, stop eating so much sugar. Maybe you could do this and that. And it pissed me off so bad. I would get so angry because I'm like, well, how dare you tell me that I just need to change my diet? How dare you tell me that I just need to work out? How dare you? And it wasn't that I just needed to work out, but that's definitely it's been a huge help um, in, in dealing with the with symptoms of depression. So this year I was decertified uh, much with much chagrin to the mental health professionals that told me it wasn't possible. I was decertified as having a serious mental illness. So I know I'll always kind of have that anxiety and stuff, but I don't, I, I no longer have the criteria to be considered SMI, which was a huge thing. So how, to do, me. how do you, how do you get decertified? Do you go back to a psychiatrist that says that you no longer have this issue? Oh man. So that was a process. I 
I went to the original psychiatrist um, that had told me I was SMI, and she said, oh, no, we had another psychiatrist that actually diagnosed you, and you didn't know about it. Wait, what? <laughs> okay. So we tracked back that one. She said, no, I didn't. So then it becomes kind of this vicious cycle, and I went to the psychiatrist I was seeing at the time that I was only going to, to be truthfully honest, because it was mandated by my custody thing that I was in mental health treatment because of this diagnosis. So... I went to her and I said, look, you need to do something. I want to be reevaluated. You need to reevaluate me. And I know that you have the power to do so. She said, you need to call your insurance company, call the insurance company. They said, no, you need to talk to her. So I went back, I recorded the call, I went back to her. I played the call. I said, you need to re reevaluate me. If you don't, I will call like over your head. I will call your supervisors and I want to be reevaluated because I don't have any of the, of the um, signs of it anymore. And I, I don't want this on me if it's not true like I don't want this label on me if it's not true and eventually I, I convinced her to reevaluate me and she told me through this whole process she kept telling me it's not possible to get decertified I don't know why you're so adamant about this process because it's not possible nobody gets decertified that's what she told me mm -hmm. so it was really just a matter of standing up for myself and fighting for myself and saying, no, I know that you can do this. I did my research and I said, I know that, it, that you can do this. I know you have the authority to decertify me if I don't meet the criteria. She said, I've never decertified it in someone. Nobody ever does that. That's just not a thing. So I, I just pushed it with my mental health professional and with the organization until she agreed to do the the she reevaluation. Did. She did the reevaluation. Right. She, she looked at me and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was wrong. And I mean, that's powerful for her, you know, to admit that she was wrong. I was really, I was really happy that she was willing to do that. But God, that was like one of the most powerful, empowering moments of my life. Just realizing I knew who I was. I knew mm -hmm. who I was. And I was, I, I just refused to let somebody else tell me that. I refused to let somebody else define me or put a label on me. Right. So, and then based on when, when you got that assessment though, Right. right. Potentially. Oh, no, I absolutely had it. I absolutely. Yeah. Mental well-being yes. <laughs> can go from mental uneasiness to mental breakdown. Right. So any right. of us can go along the spectrum at any given point. Right. Yeah. So and then with all the things that you've been doing, obviously, you had made these massive, massive changes. And I, yeah, yeah, I made a lot of changes. And like I said, there wasn't one or two. As a matter of fact, I'm developing an entire program that walks people through the positive changes they can make in their life. And it's not the changes I made per se, but the positive changes that you can make in your life to give yourself the best chance possible. Because correct me if I'm wrong, this is just my experience again, so maybe it's been different for you. But I, my, when I went to mental health professionals, there was the first thing we always did was kind of make a treatment plan as to where we wanted to go. Like what was the right. end goal? And the end goal was always obviously to, to be clean, to not self-harm, to not utilize devices like that. And it, it was just always really simple things like don't hurt yourself. <laughs> like there was no bigger picture of happiness. There was no, we want you to be happy. I want to be happy. There was, that was never on the table, like really genuine, true happiness and fulfillment was never on the table. I was told that wasn't an option. And I, it, it got to the point where happiness became kind of elusive to me. Like it was, it just, it was a pretty word, a pretty thought that wasn't for people like me. And my goal um, with my clients and with the program I'm developing is to help people no matter where they are, whether they're rock bottom like I was, or whether they're just kind of complacent. So I hope a lot of clients that it's not like they're depressed, they're just complacent. They just are going through day to day and they don't have any passion for life and they're just doing what they have to do. They don't have any symptoms of depression. They're not self-harming. They're not, you know, utilizing any kind of vice. They're not, oh, they're sleeping fine, but there's just, there's just no passion for life. There's no happiness. And my goal is to make happiness less elusive, to show people that no matter where you are, happiness is possible. It might be different for everyone. And I explain kind of the happiness spectrum. It might be different for everyone, but there's steps that every person can take to be, to be higher on their own happiness spectrum. And I agree. And I think, you know, what we have to be aware of is there may be some people that need psychiatry. There may be some people initially that might, right? Right. Get them through that. If, if you're actively addicted or if you're suicidal, or you're attempting, those have to get addressed first, Yeah. right? Because without that platform, 
it's kind of hard to see, see forward about, you know, what's a perfect day in my life. Well, if I'm not able to slow my thoughts down long enough to value who I am, to not attempt, then I can't think about, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? right. I, can't, I can't do the basic level. So I can't think about existentialism unless I have that core value, but absolutely. Yeah. I th that's the thing. Once you address those concerns, Amanda, absolutely. Then you should, we ultimately, and I would say I have it probably, you know, in different circles that the um, field that I'm have been in, it's always at the different points. Of course, once the symptom is gone and it's been abated, what is, what is a principal day in the life look like for you? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think there definitely are extreme cases, like I said, where people need that mental health treatment. But for me, it's like, I don't think I ever could have got out of that severe suicidal depression had I not started making changes. So I would almost argue that these things have to be done kind of in tangent sometimes. Like, yes, they need to be seeing a psychiatrist if they're in active suicidal thoughts or um, active addiction. It can be very beneficial to see a professional, but at the same time, that professional should be encouraging them to make positive life changes, if that makes sense. And I would tell you in the in a circle, I mean, in the, the circles that I'm here in Canada, absolutely. That's what we're looking at all the time. I think Canada probably has better, <laughs> a better healthcare probably, system. Probably here. different systems, right? Because um, absolutely, because I, you know, I would always say being a trauma specialist and an addiction specialist that um, let's, let's take up the care of the critical symptoms, but once the critical symptoms are gone, you know, who are you really under there? Yeah. Right. And then yeah. ultimately, you're right. We all are looking for peace of mind and happiness at the end yeah. of the day. Right? Nobody wants to suffer. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So what do you keep your eye on with yourself or for the others that you coach to kind of have them recognize if they're slipping backwards? What kind of things do people that are listening, let's say they're singing, wow, sounds interesting. You know, I, I, I'm doing some stuff. Oh, I haven't even thought about that. Or I'm on a critical end. I need to kind of, you know, get the right support. What kind of things do you keep uh, your eye on for yourself or even for others that you're coaching about? I think the, I'm slipping backwards. For me, it's when I start get, getting frequent cravings for drugs or alcohol, or I actually was a smoker at one time too, and I don't really crave cigarettes very much, but if I start noticing that I'm craving more, that I'm okay. having trouble sleeping, that I'm getting more irritable with people, like with the people I care about, when I start getting really depressed, I, it comes out in anger, and I'm not an angry person by, by default, but I start getting really irritable and angry, and I, I think the emotions, some people will get really depressed, like they'll withdraw, they'll start getting very uh, mm -hmm. sad. I think really, whether you're watching yourself or you're watching those people close to you and you're just wanting to make sure that they're, that they're in a good place and that they're staying on track, if you're noticing that they're acting outside of what is kind of normal for them, what's natural for them, what their genuine true personality is, if you notice them getting more aggressive, if you notice them getting more... Uh, withdrawn if you notice them getting more emotional and more uh, they're crying more or whatever i think just any kind of strong emotions that are becoming more frequent that's my that's my um, cue and I, I i i didn't quit drinking entirely because i never really had what i would consider an addiction to alcohol i i, I would have a glass of wine or whatever every now and then. But if I notice that that's becoming a daily thing, or if I notice, oh, maybe I should have a second glass, or I, I notice that I'm trying to turn to things to numb out pain again, because I know that's, that's a very slippery slope. I can have a glass of wine with dinner and be fine because I, I never really battled alcoholism, but I, I know that it could go south if I let it, if I didn't you know, keep, keep. So just so just keeping, your, keeping your radar on. Staying yeah. mindful, that's really the, the right, my, right. with yourself, staying mindful. Yes, How yes. am I feeling? Am I handling stress well? Am I utilizing like appropriate skills? I have an entire module in the program I was telling you about, about like stress management and building a toolbox to help mm -hmm. yourself, you know, through that. Because that's something we're not taught in school how to deal with anxiety, depression, stress, yeah. none of that. And it's really important for me. It was really important for me to develop and yes, learn. I mean, we have to learn these skills of how to care for ourselves, how to be mindful of where we are, where we should be, what we can do. It's, it's a super important thing to develop. 
So this has been a, an amazing time. Thank you so much for, for spending the time and, and sharing your wisdom and what a, what a, what a huge story and, you know, uh, what a breath that you can offer that perspective, you know? So for anybody listening that may be struggling, what, what words do you have for them? You know, I say this a lot, but my dad's last words to me were don't give up hope because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And at the time I thought it was just, you know, kind of a pretty phrase. And now I have to tell myself that when I'm getting into that negative self-talk, I'm getting into that kind of hopeless moment is I went from being on a ledge to being genuinely happy and fulfilled. And if I wouldn't have given myself that chance, if I wouldn't have tried, I would have never been here. And you, you never know what tomorrow could bring. And that's not just what tomorrow could bring. You never know how you're going to feel tomorrow. You could, mm -hmm. you know, take that first step and start moving toward happiness and a healthy life. So I know that sometimes it can, let's just be honest, suck. <laughs> it's, it's horrible when you get bombarded with those, those feelings and it's just trying to take over your mind. I, I say that it's like having been bullied, it's like being bullied, but the bully is in your head and you can't walk away and you can't right. escape and you can't go tattle on them or whatever it is you need to do. You can't, you know, seek, go call the cops or whatever. You can't really do anything because it's inside of your mind, but you're not those thoughts. You're not that bully and developing a better relationship with that voice, with that, those thoughts is really the best medicine for uh, moving, moving forward. And it, they, they can be overcome. It just takes some time. It, it can be done. Well, thank you so much. Um, where can everybody reach you if they're, if they're interested in hearing more about you or uh, working with you? What, where is it that people can reach you? So you can go to my website, amandawebsterhealth.com, and you can actually download a little cheat sheet that will give you the top 10 nutrient deficiencies that affect mental health, which is awesome because a lot of people don't realize the connection between <laughs> nutrients and food and mental health. So it'll give you that nice little cheat sheet. Spoiler alert, most people are deficient in at least one. It also tells you where you can find them, uh, different foods and stuff that have them. And if you sign up for my mailing list, you will get an exclusive invitation to my Facebook group. It's called The Pack because I've always felt connected to wolves. So the people close to me have always kind of been my pack. So on there, I post a lot of just motivational things, workout videos, uh, just a lot of different things. The, the podcast I'm on, the articles that I, that I participate in. But also, I, I just started a YouTube channel that kind of teaches people some different methods for coping with anxiety, stress, which is so important right now. We need definitely some stress management skills during this time. And I posted some different scientific methods for coping with that in a healthy manner. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at Amanda Webster Health. So I really love connecting with people. I love hearing people's stories. Um, if you do have any questions or if you're, if you're looking for some insight, I'm always happy to hear from anyone. Well, thanks again, Amanda. So when you walk away, just think, uh, today might feel like a ledge, but it doesn't take much to get off that ledge, but you just have to go, go into yourself and be mindful of what, what small thing could I do that may start the process of me ensuring that that voice that Amanda talks about uh, gets lower um, and the proper voice that needs to be have the volume is has the focus which is really what's going to make me happy so thanks for tuning in and uh, Amanda thanks for sharing your wisdom and for anyone needing any uh, support around mental health and wellness as you know I'm a keynote speaker uh, and a trainer consultant you can reach me at roxanderhodge.com Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.